cool. Now we're live. Uh, so we just spent the past five minutes talking to ourselves and and, and having introductions. Um, so yeah, I wanted to thank once again uh, to Council Member Plummer and Council Member Kassar for joining us uh, tonight to talk about criminal justice reform. Uh, you know, as mentioned, uh, Council uh, Councilwoman Plummer uh, represents uh, at large four in the city of Houston, and and, and Council Member Kassar uh, is here right in, in the beautiful city of Austin. Um, and, and both, in, in my opinion, are, are just you know huge progressive champions in their respective cities. And it's honestly an honor and, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a treat to have both of you on. So, so with that, uh, you know, once again, um, just just wanted to just d dive right into I guess the differences between uh, Austin City Council and Houston City Council. And you know, Councilwoman Plummer, you could you know start us off. Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, Sahib, thank you for allowing me to join in this conversation. Um, uh, this is, is such a pleasure, and I've heard so many amazing things about Councilman um, Gassar. So this is really great. You're you're a hero here in Houston uh, for all the good work that you've done in Austin. So this is a, really a pleasure. Um, I do believe that the main difference between the two the two cities is that we have a very strong mayoral form of government. So our our large members and our district members we're not able to put anything on our agendas, and so. If we find a specific topic that is incredibly important to either our district or um, the constituents in Houston, you know, we um, have to convince the administration that it's something that we want to focus on um, and get that specific issue placed on the agenda. Otherwise, honestly, it's very difficult to to um, to get anything through, and we have to be incredibly creative uh, in terms of you know how to get the the messages out and how to. Uh, bring bodies together, collective bodies together for a private or a public um, sector to um, agree on an issue and to ultimately push it through. All right, cool. Thank you. Uh, Councilman? No, it's um, it's great to be here with y'all and uh, Councilman Plummer and I have been in touch through the COVID-19 pandemic about how to take care of our communities from uh, the crisis with the virus and it's all, we have had a long-standing crisis with public safety and with policing in our cities. Um, and so it's really important for us to be having the conversation. And yeah, it's um, it's really important um, in the city of Austin that it actually just takes four of the 11 council members to agree to have an item on the agenda. Um, and as a matter of fact, actually it only takes two of us to agree to have something for discussion um, off the agenda. Mm -hmm. And so things like our fair chance hiring ordinance, which actually ban private employers from asking people about their criminal history before giving them an interview, mm -hmm. that we just put on the agenda um, and we're able to build a campaign of formerly incarcerated folks um, and their families around to make that change or our recent uh, decision to delay police cadet classes mm -hmm. and to potentially try to make a major disinvestment from over policing and a reinvestment into community. Again, um, while we've been, I've been happy that the mayor has in our city has voted for those sorts of measures mm -hmm. that are brought forward by district council members. Uh, and so that's a, a big difference in the system of government. Cool, and and, and, and just to kind of go off, if you don't mind, I, I know Councilwoman uh, Poole in, in, in Austin and you are the ones who came up with the uh, shutting down the academy for, for, for next for, you know, for next year due to, uh, you know, reforms. If you don't mind going into a little bit more detail on that and what that kind of looks like and, and, and you know, what, what, the, what the hope and goal of, of that is. Yeah, you know, for, for so far too long, local government's primary response to a problem is policing. Mm -hmm. Instead of treating mental health uh, with mental health professionals, we treat it with policing. Instead of treating yeah. homelessness with housing, we treat it with policing. Right. Mm -hmm. and so we have to shift that priority, and that means shifting the budget. So um, I and others have committed to a $100 million reduction to our uh, $420 million plus police budget. Mm -hmm. uh, and we'll be rolling out final proposals, big proposals, as early as this weekend for votes um, later this week, so that mm -hmm. we can basically, by not having some police cadet classes, we can open a family violence shelter. By yeah. not funding some overtime, we can um, have enough ambulances for the COVID-19 pandemic. And so that's mm -hmm. really what we're working on. Do you, do you, and, and, and Councilman Plummer, do you see anything like that on the horizon for, for the state of Houston or? Uh, Y'all, I want to pack up my bags and move to Austin. <laughs> like, no, I mean, what you're saying is so important. And no, I mean, we are we are waiting to see what comes out with the task force. So all of my recommendations, I'm in the things that the councilman Kassar is just kind of mentioning. Mm -hmm. um, we, 
now we had an, a seven and a half hour meeting, um, public safety meeting, and those those suggestions now went to a task force that was chosen by the mayor. And so now we're waiting to see what comes out of that. But no, we uh, I was, you know, my amendment was was attempting to um, to, to remove some c- civilian vacancies mm-hmm. and just take those monies that were kind of earmarked in the budget. Um, take that that money and um, attach it to, you know, tra- additional training, a cahoots program, you know, um, which which would assist with mental health, you know, a reentry programs, my brother keeper programs, mm-hmm. those kind of social the social sh- shortfalls that we find the the police typically um, become a catch all for. So, uh, but no, I, I I wish that we did. Uh, still waiting to see what happens out of that task force. Okay. But what I would say is, you know, first of all, we need you in Houston to continue to <laughs> that change. But also, the change can happen really fast. So in the last two uh, budget cycles before this, I made amendments to try to move a million dollars or less out of the police budget into social services and didn't have a majority vote. Uh, and here we are, not that long later, where, um, where you know, the movement is shifting uh, you know, the people are leading and sometimes the politicians start to follow and start to catch up. Yeah. So I, I hope and expect, right, that in each of our mm-hmm. cities, people keep pushing us to do more. But if you had told me a year ago, after losing on trying to move a million dollars, that we'd be trying to move a hundred million dollars this yeah. year. No way. So yeah. there's, no, no, you're, you're, you're definitely, you're, you're definitely right on that. I, I do believe that, you know, a lot of people think that, that we lost, you know, because our amendments did not get, did not pass. Um, I believe that we really didn't. I think it was a win. I don't believe that we would be having the deep uh, uh, conversations that we're having. Uh, I know that the eight can't wait would not have been an executive order in place. I don't believe a task force would have been created. Um, Cahoots is now being supported by our unions here and people are really focusing on mental health concerns. So I, I do see the change happening. It's just not you know, not of course, we want things to happen right now, and I do understand that we do have to trust the process. But the con- the conversations are being had, and and um, and we're going to keep on pushing through. And as soon as this this task force gives you know of some type of um, suggestions or recommendations, then we'll take it from there. But but you're right; it does take time, and we have to start somewhere. And uh, I believe this is a really good start for us. Yeah, so so I, I guess I have, I have a few follow up questions for that. Uh, first, to uh, I'll just I'll stick with you, uh, Councilwoman Plummer. What does that tax task force look like? Uh, you know, what does it entail? Who, who comprises it? And you know, what's the ultimate objective of it? Sure. So the task force is is the mayor's task force. We were able to submit names. Each council member were, mm-hmm. were able to submit a couple of different names, but then they were vetted like, in, on some level, and then they were chosen. Mm-hmm. And so um, it's a large group of you know community leaders, attorneys, um, Houstonians, people that, you know, yeah. uh, the, the ministers, you know, they're, they're just a large group of people. I think it's like 45 of them. Okay. And, uh, and they're at a point now kind of, I think they kind of broke down into, into, um, into kind of committees and then they're focusing on issues and, and bringing forth suggestions. But like I said, I think they, we submitted about a hundred pages of suggestions. Mm-hmm. To the task force in terms of what we, what we you know what we would like to see happen so okay that's cool. that's what it is right now so and then and then, and then uh, council member uh kasar what, what do you think was that catalyst like you said a year ago it was hard to you know to you know hit the budget by a million and now we're looking at you know one year later you know you're looking at a hundred million dollar uh proposal what what changed what was the catalyst i think obviously the the most obvious catalyst, of course, is the, the uprisings and protests and the mm-hmm. level of engagement, not just in the streets, but um, amongst neighbors and family members. I mean, mm-hmm. we got in just one week, um, you know, we're a city of a million people. Mm-hmm. My office alone got 20,000 emails from mm-hmm. Austinites in a week. Mm-hmm. We never had that level of engagement on anything, much less something, you know, of, of that level of significance and that level mm-hmm. of climate change. But it wasn't just that week, right? We also have built between working on fair chance hiring and ending all arrests and fines for personal marijuana possession mm-hmm. and ending the juvenile curfew and uh, our, law, our laws criminalizing homelessness. There has been a, a campaign over the last five years to recognize mm-hmm. the fact that policing is not the solution. Mm-hmm. Uh, mass incarceration is an issue in our community. And so there have been 
the activists and advocates that also have built those relationships so that we can translate the the hurt and the demands in the streets mm -hmm. into sort of a change in governance. Uh, and so I think that kind of five years of groundwork plus this moment uh, is, is what's creating the opportunity right now. And I still don't know whether the votes will be there or what we're trying to get done next week, but I hope that we're close. Yeah, um, and, and then talking about uh, you know the unfortunate murder of George Floyd, what what did that mean to to both of you? Well, for me personally, you know, I'm I'm a, a single mom of of three African American boys, mm -hmm. so I mean, that could have been one that could have been my kid, mm -hmm. uh, and, and and I you know I worry about that on a consistent basis, and I, I join other mothers, um, you know, and, and fathers. I mean, around mm -hmm. the country, I think a lot of us saw George Floyd, our saw our children in him, mm -hmm. and the Abilities. And, 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 you know, like you had mentioned before, even the, the women, I mean, Rihanna, I mean, there's so there, it's not only him, it's just everything that happened. It was almost like this, this storm. And I, I say perfect, not in the way of perfect, but all of these, um, everything kind of happened at the same time. Um, we had other murders that happened here in Houston. Rihanna passed away, George Floyd. Uh, I mean, just so many things happened at once. And so, I don't. I believe that there there are very few moments in life where that happens, where the whole world and then COVID happens. So now we're all staying home and we're engaged in what's happening on television, and we're all more aware of our environment and our surroundings. We're not distracted by work. Mm -hmm. So I think there's 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 not many moments in time where all of our attention is brought to that. And um, and so because of that, it kind of created that perfect storm and um, everyone wanted to see change happen and everyone was incredibly engaged. And so um, for me, obviously, like I said, it was it was uh, we just can't let this pass us. Yeah. And, and, and I'm glad you brought up Brianna Taylor. And, and I think, unfortunately, you know, you know, folks like, you know, black women at times are, are not they don't get the same media attention as, you know, other other populations, and especially black, black trans women. So I, I, I think it's important to keep amplifying their voices and their stories um, when others are, are quite silent on that. Uh, Council Member Kassar. I mean, it's obviously just horrible, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you, you it's, it's so, um, it's, it's awful. And you can imagine how many times that that ha happens and it's not on video, you know? Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, one of the things that has changed me and shaped me the most as an elected official was uh, the killing of David Joseph in our city, who was uh, a high schooler mm -hmm. uh, uh, who was killed naked in the street you know, he was having a mental health crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that that was our city's response to his need is mm -hmm. just just horrible. And his family is in my district and I've kept in touch um, with his loved ones and that, is, that has shaped um, me forever. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and just recently, right, we had Mike Ramos, Mike Ramos yeah. here, um, with his hands up unarmed. Yeah. Um, and, and we are still you know, paying those police officers um, yeah. uh, without any discipline anytime in the foreseeable near future because the trial has been delayed. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it's clear. I mean, it brings up, there's a lot of parts to it, right? I mean, yeah. obviously, obviously, we have to do everything we can to protect against um, police violence and killing in any form, but then also, you know, the fact that, right, it it's loose cigarettes, right, mm -hmm. or somebody uh, accused of of counterfeit these these small things that frankly are not a significant harm result mm -hmm. in extra judicial killing. Mm -hmm. um, that also emphasizes why we can't keep throwing policing at everything. Um, yeah. So on the one hand, absolutely, we need. Um, you know, strong office of police oversight. We need um, we need strong forms of accountability. You know, I'm offering next week for us to pull internal affairs out of APD so that we don't have APD investigating APD anymore. Mm -hmm. but at the same time, you know, the fact that you can have um, some in, in the end, we, we have to also start peeling back, sending police to everything because that's also right. part of the issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know, I, I know, I know specifically in the in the city of Austin, and I'm going to keep it with you, Councilmember Kassar. Um, you know, you're, you're you're one of the more you know vocal members who have talked about uh, you know Chief Manley stepping down. Um, how how does that look, and what will the next steps be? Um, you know, Chief Manley stepping down isn't something that the Austin City Council can enforce. It would, I, I believe, it has to come from uh, the city manager. Uh, he's the only one who could demote Chief Manley. But 
what type of healing and what, what type of progress would it, you know, what would it look like if, if, if he was to ultimately, uh, you know, step down? So I was trying to unmute myself. Um, I, you're fine. <laughs> I also saw some questions here in the comments that I'm happy to get to um, here in a second, but can you sure. know when? Um, but you know, it brings me, brought me no joy to say that the chief should resign. I, mean, mm -hmm. I recognize in my job, right, that we work with people, and I have gotten to to know the chief as a father and as a person who has been working for the city of Austin for for decades, uh, born mm -hmm. and raised here. But the fact of the matter is, right, he did not act when an assistant chief came and told him some text messages might come out. And if they come out, I might have to resign. And then later the chief got an email explaining that that person had used some of the worst racial slurs in the American language, mm -hmm. in the English language. Um, and he didn't do anything and that person retired with their full pension. Mm -hmm. And then the protesters get shot um, by these uh, baton rounds, these lead pellet rounds. And we had almost two young people in the hospital fighting for their lives just for protesting. And then we had Mike Ramos get killed and those officers not disciplined and that uh, disciplinary decision delayed for no reason that I can see. Mm -hmm. I mean, at some point it's unforgivable. Mm -hmm. And I think it's so hard, even if we change the budget, even if we pass policies for people to believe mm -hmm. that things are going to get better when, um, when any one of those things, usually somebody wouldn't still be in their job. Mm -hmm. and so ultimately the council can't fire or discipline any police officer by law. Mm -hmm. but we can ultimately um, hire and fire the city manager and things may be getting to that point mm -hmm. if we don't see the kind of change that um, that we need. And then, and then keeping in line of, of this, how, Letitia, uh, Councilman Plummer, how do you, yeah, sorry. Um, how do you feel about the job that uh, the police chief in, in, in Houston has done and how has the uh, overall uh, reception been of, of his work in terms of, you know, this, uh, you know, everything that's come from the fallout of, of George Floyd's murder? Sure. So, I, I mean, I believe, you know, the, uh, the police chief obviously is chosen by the mayor. And um, we don't have a lot of control in the same way as Austin. We don't have a lot of control, um, you know, over what he can do or can't do. Mm -hmm. uh, there is some contention between the police department and the unions. And, uh, you know, we had a, um, a, you know, that the no knock warrant raid that happened uh, here in Houston, which was a very, very big problem. Um, Officer Goines was, you know, a, big problem in that situation and um, a lot of those um, a lot of those officers almost got off freely and then their DA ended up indicting them so mm -hmm. you know in some ways he's, he's getting some good press and then but now I think people are, are, are not looking at kind of the froth on top of the car they're really digging deep and looking at reform how it really should be and how we should be acting differently and mm -hmm. taking responsibility of what's going on. And so now I think people are looking at him a little bit differently than they did before. I know he was marching with people. He was getting a lot of really positive national press. Um, but now people, now that the, the, the dust is settling. And so people are, are, are definitely looking a little bit deeper into, into what more he can do mm -hmm. and the, the change that need to have need to happen um, in the police department itself. I mean, and then having an independent oversight board that is truly independent is something that I would like to see. And I, I put in my amendments. Um, I don't believe that, you know, like councilman said, I mean, I don't believe that the police need to oversight themselves. I mean, we need to have someone separately. We have dollars attached that so they can hire investigators and they can hire someone separate that can look at these files and cases properly. Because you're right, we are only hearing about George Floyd and Beyonce Taylor. There's so many other people that are that are dying. Mm -hmm. um, in the same way, they're not getting caught on tape and um, and that we don't hear about. But it's happening every single day and, and, and we need to, do, um, to deal with the issue. So it's not perfect by any means of the imagination. And, uh, you know, we're about to re look at our um, our union contract. Mm -hmm. And I have made a request to the mayor to be able to be in that room. And um, because we are if, if you're invited by the mayor, you're able to do that. And I did send an invitation or ask. Um, up to the mayor and to the administration to be in that room so we can have more conversations about um, about how um, that contract is written because I know what the intention is to protect the police but uh, this is the only time reform is going to happen and we got to get it done and we have to figure out a way that we can really bring police and communities together in a better way. 
All right, cool. So uh, just I, I kind of want to just focus a little bit more on the amendments that unfortunately failed. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so you know, as as folks might or might not know, uh, you you brought up these amendments. Uh, I believe the day after uh, George Floyd was like to rest in, in the city of Houston, mm -hmm. and and you know they were just shot down, but but the whole you know Houston City Council and and concerning that you you had to say my heart is a little sad today because I believe people have spoken. Uh, I don't know how much louder we can become across this world. Um, so how did you come across, like, A, what were your amendments? Uh, sure. You know, how did you, you know, you know come across them and, and, and see those as, you know, fit amendments for, you know, the, you know, the issue at hand? And, and, and why do you think, you know, the majority of, of city council, uh, you know, voted against them? You know, the whole entire time I was running, I realized the, and then obviously as a, as a mom of three black, you know, three black boys, I, I knew there were problems with police in the communities. There was a, there was a huge disconnect there. Um, and so it's always been something, you know, that I've always been focusing on. My son was at 14, was arrested in West University. He was detained because he looked like someone that um, had broken to another home. And the only reason he didn't get taken to uh, to jail was because one of the mothers came out and was running down the street saying, no, this is my, this is like my kid. Like Sharif was like my kid and he was in khakis and a polo. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think it has anything to do with how you dress or how you look. It's just, it's just that bias that that's there when it comes to black men specifically. Um, and so this is something that I've always thought about. Um, and then on my campaign, I just saw all the social injustices and inequities that we see in our communities that, that because um, those are there, they, they naturally direct a person to crime or, or to or entering the justice system for some way, shape or form. And so my amendments were, were budgetary amendments that were placed because I, as a business owner, I know that if you don't have money, programs don't work. So we had to figure out a way to attach dollars to programs. And so um, you know, our recommendations in those amendments were things like, you know, putting money into um, an oversight board, making sure that it was a directly a super an independent oversight board where they could hire, uh, they could hire independent investigators where they can create a dashboard so we could track information properly. Um, it was reentry programs that that really um, assist our, our 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 neighbors to not go to jail again, uh, to allow them to get housing and, and job training. Um, it was reaching down deep to our young boys that don't get mentorship in our, in our My Brother's Keepers uh, program that the health department manages right now uh, to make sure that they can have mentorship so they don't have to be a part of the judicial system. Um, it was training for the Eight Can't Wait, which the mayor very quickly announced um, at George Floyd's, uh, you know, funeral that he was going to put out an executive order, uh, so we can watch and you know and and, and control how um, police brutality and uses of forces are used. So it was a wide net um, of issues that seemed, in a lot of ways, to a lot of people that they didn't connect, but mm -hmm. they absolutely did. They they connected from the grassroots. Uh, causes of the problem to when the problem happens, how do we handle it? And um, and and unfortunately, you know, we we did not get it passed, but you know, we are seeing some momentum happening from them. And I, I had attached dollars to it because, uh, like I said, programs that don't have money sit on a shelf, and we have to keep on finding grant money or other ways of looking at it or other ways of finding funding, and it just ends up delaying the process. And that's why it was really uh, important to me to get those through um, at that time. And then the last piece was the CODES program, which I feel is um, one of the best pieces of that legislation or, or that amendment, primarily because I was able to have great conversations with our commissioner's court at Harris County. And I, just the day before, he allocated $5 million to any any municipal in any municipality uh, that would allow some type of um, of crisis intervention response team uh, that we could that we could put in place that specifically dealt with mental health did, that did not include a police officer on hand. Mm -hmm. And 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 I apologize if you if you answer this. Why do you think the the rest of the uh, council voted against it? I mean, I, I mean, I mean, just listening to this as a as a as a citizen, as someone who's resided both in, in Houston and Austin, like it seems like it's a no brainer, right? Um, so what, why do you think it failed? Yeah, you know, um, I, I don't know. I, I, I definitely feel that they know it's important. I don't 
believe it wasn't important. I just believe that in this particular situation, so many of us are new mm -hmm. and um, we did not have the administration support and that was clear. And, and you know, this is this really strong mayoral form of government. So mm -hmm. I believe that to push against something that isn't really being supported by the administration is, is, is a hard pill to swallow. And um, a lot of our members are just trying to navigate through the process. I, they heard, I know they heard the voices. I mean, I know they did. I mean, it was 60,000 people that, you know, marched. Um, and, and so I think that I, I'm, I'm interested to see what happens with this task force, because if things don't come out of the task force, like we, um, that we believe that it should, I think that we're going to see a lot more members jumping on board uh, to getting some stuff through. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm definitely optimistic um, and we're, you know, we'll see what's happening, but the ball is definitely rolling and, um, and we're going to make sure the momentum continues. Cool. And we do have some questions coming in. I'm not ignoring them. We will definitely get to them um, at the end of this, uh, at, the, at, the, at the end of this show. Um, so I guess back to you, council member, because our, um, unlike, unfortunately, the uh, struggles that, Councilmember Plummer has faced, um, you know, things seem like on, a, on an upward trajectory uh, in the city of Austin. I, I know originally when it came to some some cuts in APD, there were, you know, there were a lot, a lot of members who, who voted for, but also members who voted against. Uh, but it, I, if you don't mind, I guess, uh, talking you through about where we, where we were and where we are, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, city of Austin and, and, and you know, policing and, and reform and all that stuff. No, I one other piece that I haven't gotten to mm -hmm. mention is you know, our police association contract, which I think was uh, a really important moment for our council and our whole community, where the council, for the first time in our city's history, um, did not uh, agree to the police association contract, sent it back for negotiation because of some of the provisions that did not provide mm -hmm. enough accountability and transparency. And I think that was a really important moment where we stood together and said, you know, we don't have to do things the way that we have always done them. There's restrictions under the state law. There's a lot of things that make it really hard in Texas mm -hmm. to make the change we need to make, but we need to use every tool available to us. And one of those was to say no. Um, and so I think that was, was an important moment. Um, mm -hmm. And unfortunately, since then, what we've seen is not from a lot of our everyday police officers, but from the police association leadership, continued misinformation, uh, spreading and saying that we want uh, people to get hurt. Um, and that's just so far from true. And so when we talk about the state of where we are, I think that my hope is that we our entire $100 million proposal passes next week. Yeah. But regardless, we'll get something. We'll, we'll generate some amount of change. I hope that we get the full thing. Mm -hmm. But what we're going to start to see is the continued misinformation and fear mongering because I believe that people can be more safe. We can make it so a 911 call doesn't even happen because we get somebody out of that family violence situation before it escalates, right? Mm -hmm. That we can actually address the substance use issue before there's a substance use crisis for the person. Mm -hmm. and I, it's really hard to get that message out when people are willing to spread misinformation. And so often, unfortunately, it comes from police association leadership, which actually makes us less safe when you have someone with that level of authority spreading fear mongering. Um, for example, uh, a Wall Street Journal article recently laid out that we are of the top 15 biggest cities. We are the 14th, number 14 on homicides. We are, mm -hmm. you know, if you are people getting killed here and every killing is horrific and we should stop every single yeah. one. But another chart showed that we were the ones with the biggest increase in the whole country yeah. because there are very few. And so a small increase could make it look like all of a sudden there was a huge surge. And we saw that misinformation being spread by the police chief himself, by others, that it's not untrue, but it certainly leaves a impression with people that is not accurate. Mm -hmm. And so I think that is the next struggle we're gonna have to face in Austin. Mm -hmm. It's how to make sure that as we make these trans major transitions from over-policing to community safety, how do we withstand the misinformation mm -hmm. um, and, and make sure that that doesn't set us back. So that's kind of, I think, really where we are. Yeah, cool. And then I guess this, this next question is for kind of, kind of both of you. What, what makes the climate in, in Houston and Austin so different that, you know, like, you know, the, the council member, Kassar's, you know, his, his, um, his uh, 
I'm sorry, his, uh, his plan that will be voted on next week, you know, it's something that could become a reality in the city of, of Austin. It's not, maybe not something that could, you know, see the light of day in, in the city of Houston. What, what makes both cities different? I mean, outside of, you know, I, I mean, I, I like to, I, I like to think that, you know, the city of Austin has, you know, everyone, everyone on city council is, 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 is a Dem, even though it's a nonpartisan, uh, you know, body. Uh, city of Houston is a little bit different. There's, you know, Republicans and, and even the Dems that, in my opinion, that are on the city council are, some of them are a little bit more moderate or, or conservative leaning. But uh, outside of that, what makes the two cities different in, in the ways that their, you know, their governments are looking at policing going forward? And either of you could could, yeah. could take this question. Um, I am at you know, obviously we're, you know, we live in Texas. I think that Houston is definitely more conservative than Austin is, mostly because we are really that that we're um, you know we're energy, energy capital, uh, oil and gas is is something that really drives our communities, and so, you know, from a from a financial perspective, uh, you know, people that have resources uh, have a little bit more say and power, and so uh, I, I believe that that message gets out the more conservative message um, comes out a little bit more, although Harris County is more, um, you know, more democratic. Uh, I do believe that the, the conservative voice is, is definitely heard. And, um, and when you start affecting police and, and more conservative ideas, uh, then, you know, or, you know, then I think it's, it's a little bit more difficult to get more progressive values uh, pushed mm -hmm. through. But I do want to say this though, I hear it over and over again. Yeah, you know, I think that you know myself and and council, you know, member um, Kassar, you know, they keep on people keep on saying that we're kind of progressive and these are progressive ideas. I have to just disagree in a bit. These are humanistic ideas. Yeah, yeah. These are not ideas that a left or right person should understand. And we're talking about someone dying. Mm -hmm. you know, this is not has nothing to do with being progressive. It's caring for human life. It's it's having a level of dignity. It's it's um, believing that I'm not better than you and I want you to have the same options and opportunities that I do because if we all are successful then the boat lifts together. I mean, it's got nothing to do with, in my mind, being progressive or conservative. I, I think that there's right things to do for humanity and then there are wrong things to do for humanity. And the problem, in my opinion, becomes the personal agendas that individual people have. And so, I want to make the right decisions and Austin is making the right decisions because it's making people better. It's making mm -hmm. them be more active citizens in society and it's allowing Austin overall to be a better city to live in. And I believe Houstonians want the same thing. And so these values in my mind are the right values. They're values that just um, level the playing field in so many different ways. I'd say that, yeah, you know, there's different, different histories and different political culture in each of our cities. But in so many ways, right, an everyday working class person mm -hmm. in Houston, an everyday working person in Austin, um, not that, not very different, right? I mean, there are a lot of, of everyday folks that believe that both suffer from over-policing and face economic inequality and lack of safety because we've dumped so much money into over-policing. Um, and so that is real. It's just organizing that energy into people being engaged, pushing on city council, getting engaged in elections, running for office, changing the narrative um, and changing who has power. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't so long ago, right, that that Ronald Reagan was running California. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, it, it's not like um, somebody that is working a construction job in LA versus somebody that's running a construction job, working, you know, swinging a hammer in Austin or Houston mm -hmm. has that difference of politics. Yeah. You know, all cities that are majority folks of color, you know, Houston is the most diverse city in our entire country. Mm -hmm. And so there's really not a reason why, um, why Houston shouldn't be more progressive than Austin. Um, it just has to do with, I think our own organizing, right? I mean, us, us making sure that people out organize those, um, you know, more um, traditionally powerful um, interests with the status quo. Mm -hmm. and, if, and if I could jump in, so he would just kind of add a, the last last idea um, on that. Um, I also believe that in many ways, we have been doing the same thing the same way for so long, it seems like the right thing to do. 
And so that's why I love the young energy. And I'm saying young because, guys, I hit 50 this year. <laughs> um, but the energy that all of you are bringing to politics is so, so um, inspiring because we have to do things different. Like we have to know that the way that was done before, it just it's OK for it to change. I mean, we're, we're evolving right now. And, um, and so, so it's also just getting comfortable with looking at things from a different lens. Mm -hmm. Hey, thank you. Um, so the next topic I, I want to get into. Um, so I, I read an article in the Houston Chronicle about traffic stops and if they play a, a role in, in racial bias. Um, and I know in, in Houston, um, not too long ago, uh, Breon King uh, was a young black woman who's a, who's a teacher uh, who was, who was, who was in, Austin. in Austin, sorry. Uh, <laughs> my apologies. Um, uh, who, uh, who was stopped and, and uh, unlawfully, and, and you know she later you know settled uh, with, with the city. Uh, but I just wanted to get y'all's opinion on, on on traffic stops and, and racial bias. Uh, there was a there was a study done actually by the Texas Commission on Law, Law Enforcement, but the one thing uh, out of the data they were collecting that they left out was the driver's race, um, which which obviously isn't isn't very helpful. But yeah, I just wanted to get y'all's insight on that. So we've done uh, through our new independent office of police oversight that was created out of the police association contract fight, uh, a, a, an independent analysis of all racial disparities in our traffic stops. And there's a major disparity. And they actually examined how the disparity sometimes closed some at night when it's more difficult to see the race of the driver. Um, and so, you know, it's a real, it's a real problem. And we recently actually put into the city's strategic plan, which is what we are going to measure ourselves on every five years to see whether we succeeded or not to try to reach zero racial disparities in those traffic stops. Um, in so many ways, though, those disparities are inherent and are just a part of what we know occurs in, a, in America, which was founded um, on these issues of, of racial caste. And so we also are trying to also el just eliminate um, some of those interactions in the first place. So in part, we've found that, you know, a big reason people wound up in jail um, out of a traffic stop might be that they that they would get their car searched for marijuana possession. And so in our city, we have just said, you know what, we're going to stop um, arresting or issuing fines for personal marijuana possession. One, because it's it just doesn't make sense for us to be, you know, in the Stone Ages on that. And then second, we saw that black Austinites were getting arrested seven times more often discretionary arrests for possession of marijuana than white Austinites when we know that it's used equally across racial groups. I mean, we have a statue of Willie Nelson across the street from City Hall. Right? This is a city that, that supposedly celebrated openness on that, but it, it was a, but that only applied to certain people. Right. And so uh, on the one hand, I think uh, continuing to use the traffic stop as the way that uh, police officers interact with the public, we've got to change that. And then also, you know, uh, continuing to arrest people for these low level offenses um, generally has to stop. So part of what we did was we passed something called our freedom city policies that say, we're gonna, if there is an option to give someone a citation because there isn't actually a direct threat to anybody, then we should give a citation in every instance rather than giving the option to sometimes arrest people because that's when we so often saw those racial disparities. Oh, cool. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Plummer? Yeah, so no, I think this is a very important uh, topic. So as we all know, when you stop, get stopped for a ticket of, of any kind, there's typically a fine involved, and that fine um, turns into some type of resource for the city or for the county. Uh, and where are the highest chances of someone having to make a decision between paying their internet bill, buying food for their children, putting gas in the car, um, than a, an area of lower income people, which typically are black and brown people. And so we are going to be the ones naturally that maybe don't have, you know, have an expi ex, you know, expired um, uh sticker on our cars, or maybe we don't have insurance that month, or the, the chances are higher for poor people to have um, issues, not because they don't want to do that, because they have other priorities in their lives that they need to focus on. And so 
what I believe is you go into a poor community and nine times out of 10, someone is going to have an issue with their car. And, um, and what we find is that, you know, um, with black, with with black people, um, that are stopped, that they typically end up getting searched uh, more than half of the time. And so, it's just like this chain reaction. And once again, it's that racial bias we, we, that we talk about is that chain reaction of, you know, where can I make, where can I go today to get my 10 tickets for the day to hit my goals or my quota? And, um, and, and, and it ends up being in, in our, in communities of color. And so, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a real, it's a real problem. I'm, I'm dealing right now with the uh, the failure to appear issues that we have. We've got uh, about 150,000 people um, in the Houston area that have gotten tickets that didn't that didn't show up for court because probably they didn't they can't afford the fines and now they've lost their driver's licenses, which now turns into a whole other category, a whole situation in terms of not being able to get a job, not being able to take care of their families and things of that sort. So. It's this constant cyclic effect of, um, of people that are poor and continuing to keep them down. And, um, and, 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 and having any type of racial bias and traffic stops is kind of where it starts. I and mean, that's the beginning of them getting into the, uh, the judicial system. All right, thank you. And, and I think I, I might've heard that Harris County, I don't know where Houston is out on it, has gotten, it's maybe getting out of the omni-based system. It's a system we just got out of. Yes. Which puts a hold on people's license. Yes, they can't renew it when they didn't pay a fine. That's what I'm talking about. It just keeps compounding. Yes. Uh, and so we finally got out of that system, and I don't know where Houston is, but I hear that Harris County might. So apply. right. So there were 500, uh, 550,000 holds. Uh, it totaled to about 175,000 people. Uh, 50,000 of those people lived in Harris County, and you're absolutely right. Uh, Harris County um, released the holds of them, and I'm in con- on, in contact right now we, with uh, with one of the judges that's here that kind of manages that. We actually. Um, just reactivated and uh, approved their con the omnibase contract. Uh, I voted, I did vote against that. And, um, and now I'm trying to bring attention to it. The, the contract, the way the contract is written though, it does allow us to, um, it was 30 day notice, get out of the contract. And uh, that's what I'm really going to push for because once again, I mean, with COVID happening right now, um, for our, for people not to be able to get their licenses, just making it more difficult for them to get, get their lives back on track. Yeah. I quickly want to touch on the last topic that that I uh, that I had on, on the agenda, and then we'll we'll get to questions. Just because I think it's so important. Um, I, I I live by this mantra that it's, uh, you should always judge a society and, and and leaders not on how they treat the most prosperous, uh, you know, in their you know in their community, but how they treat the most underserved. Uh, and unfortunately, the, the homeless the homeless situation and, and homeless folks in both in, in Houston and in Austin have had a very uh, you know, you know, hard time and, and difficult time when it comes to how they're often viewed. Uh, you know, in, in many cases, you know, I, I, in, in my opinion, they're almost stuck in the cycle of, of being homeless because they're, they're they're punished by you know where they might sleep or where they might need to stay. You know, some cities have laws that if you were to you know you know by feeding a homeless person on the, on the side of the road, it, it's it, you know there's a fine associated to that. Um, I know Harris County launched a thing uh, th- th- through the commissioner's court. Uh, to, to combat homelessness. And I know here in Austin, uh, thankfully Save Austin is now an uh, effort um, to criminalize homelessness failed. Uh, but, but just, you know, a quick, um, you know, insight of, of what y'all think, um, you know, the, the fight against homelessness and how we, how we help, you know, the most uh, underserved of our communities, you know, what that looks like. A part of what we're gonna be suggesting uh, for the budget next week is a significant investment in permanent supportive housing. Mm-hmm. You know, we have all of these empty hotel rooms right now during COVID-19 without tourism. And it's and we're starting to lease those or start buying hotels so that people have a place to go as they get hooked into job programs, as they get um, plugged back into the level of social networks that people need to be able to get back onto their feet. Um, but the fact of the matter is, for so long, Austin just hid our problem, right? As mm-hmm. we get more and more unaffordable, uh, as housing prices rose, more and more people lost their homes. I mean, it's just directly connected to the cost of paying rent. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and then basically we criminalized that homelessness, gave thousands, tens of thousands of tickets to people who couldn't pay them, cycled them in and out of the jail, 
They wound up with arrest warrants that made it so they couldn't get uh, housing. It would continue to reinstate that trauma um, and, and made it harder and harder for us to serve people. And so in the last year, we've said we're going to stop um, trying to police our way out of homelessness because it's only made things worse. And what we're trying to close on now is the promise of ending homelessness. And we actually got a report back that with just what they call the modest investment mm-hmm. of $20 million every single year, in addition to what we're currently doing, we can actually start re- truly bringing down uh, the people, like, number of people experiencing homelessness in our community. Um, right. and, and people are much more aware of it now that um, we aren't just moving the problem from one neighborhood to another. Mm-hmm. But before we got rid of those laws, I just remember sometimes people would get kicked out of one encampment in my district mm-hmm. and they'd wind up start getting calls from another neighborhood right up the street where people wound up. Um, so you never can just solve the problem by people throwing people in jail for a night and then having them come out worse off. Uh, Council of Employment. Yeah, I mean, we're we're doing, I believe we're doing a decent job with our homelessness. We um, we, we are we do try to find homes for them. We try to direct them and, and really kind of give that um, those wraparound services that they need. Clearly, it's a problem. It's definitely not per- not perfect. Uh, I'm very worried uh, with what we're the eviction rate that we're going to see very soon. Um, there's so many people that are one step away from home, homelessness, and as you know, we didn't we don't have a, a grace period ordinance here in Houston. Um, we've just kind of continued to inject money into um, you know into to help people pay their rent, uh, but there are going to be so many people that are not going to be able to get the assistance that we need. So I'm watching those numbers. I'm watching to see uh, how many people are going to become homeless because they can't stay in their homes. And um, obviously now that's going to be a public health issue, having more people on the street. Um, and uh, and we're going to have to figure you know out another way to, to, to once again fix the problem. But but you're right. I mean, you know, folks get, the, if, they, if they're coming out of jail, they get a one-way bus, a bus ticket on Greyhound and they end up at the bus station. And at that point, there's really no entity that kind of assists them to getting their lives back on track. Um, a lot of them don't want to go. A lot of them don't want to go to the shelters because they don't feel like the shelters are safe. Um, and you know, and 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 so we have to figure out a way, a better way, I believe, to um, to assist them with just kind of getting their lives back on track. But I will, I will say that we we do have a good housing department here, and um, and I and I, I believe the intention is really good in terms of uh, assisting them with getting on their feet and 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 finding a way to get some permanent housing. Thank you. I, I really appreciate um, everything, but uh, but you know, but especially those those uh, answers to the question. Um, so we do have a few uh, questions uh, from the audience, and we have uh, very limited time, so let's just kind of jump right into it. Uh, Councilmember Kassar, um, so we have a question for you. Uh, do you support uh, Councilmember Harper Madison's proposal to delay APD's budget for six months? And if so, how do we reinvest funds into necessary departments without that piece? So um, my, I have proposed that we immediately begin uh, next week reinvesting dollars from over-policing over into a set of safety investments, adding family violence shelter, adding the permanent supportive housing we just talked about, kicking off some harm reduction, continuum of care uh, supports for uh, people with substance use issues, um, actually adding the ambulances and, and EMS and public health supports we need during the COVID-19 crisis because we're running low on ambulances. We need to start reallocating those dollars next week. So that's so I'm I'm ready to do immediate reinvestment. Councilmember Harper Madison has raised an important point, which is, you know, we don't transform policing in a week. Um, and I agree that we should um, uh, only fund the police department for the next six months to hold ourselves accountable and hold everybody accountable to continuing the change well past next week. Um, some folks have asked, can we just? Uh, delay everything next week for six months, and I'm not for that. Uh, I I don't think that Councilmember Harper Madison is for that. Um, the question is, can we get a lot done this week um, and ultimately reduce APD's budget by a hundred million dollars, um, and also um, make sure we're accountable to continued change? On top of the divesting from some functions and reinvesting in others, we're also talking about doing things like separating the forensics lab from the police department because in places like Houston, you have an independent forensics lab. Uh, in Austin, we had decades worth of a, decades worth of backlogged rape kits. Uh, there was a DNA lab uh, debacle here and it really clearly showed why we need to 
separate science from the police department. Mm -hmm. uh, and clearly with other cases, people know why we need to separate things like internal affairs from the police department. So those are the sorts of things that I'm ready to get done next week and hold ourselves to doing more in the next six months. Cool. Thank you. Uh, this is a question for both of you. Uh, what are a few things that surprised you both after your constituents focus more on the budget and racial injustice in our police departments, i.e. the fact that council cannot fire the police chief. I guess I guess this more relates to you, uh, council member. Sorry. You know, the, the, I am, um, I'm so proud and amazed of how much our community has pushed on the issue. I mean, the, the city budget, we've always had you know, a decent amount of interest, but the fact the matter is we've had tons of people who have never testified before at a council meeting who didn't know who their council member was getting engaged in such an important issue um, really coming from their hearts and their lived experience and so um, as someone who is now headed into my sixth budget as a council member I've just never it is just extraordinary that out of so much hurt um, and frankly so much tragedy and so much lack of change over decades that in this moment people are are willing to sort of put their time into this and they're hoping to it is a huge responsibility. And I've been, you know, really surprised um, and I'm trying to take that really seriously and, and do think, be, be uncomfortable, do things that I never thought we would have been able to propose before. Um, and we'll see how that goes here in the coming weeks. Um, and then uh, another question for you, Councilman Kassar. Uh, in today's meeting, there was a total of $68.7 million being removed from civilian positions. Would you tell us how this is supposed to address the police violence problem? Yeah, so um, we, our police department includes civilian positions along with sworn officer positions. Mm -hmm. And so uh, a lot of our reallocation of dollars is to say, let's stop sending you know, a police officer to a mental health call. Let's take that money and put it into um, civilian mental health professionals or even into our sworn EMS department. Uh, then there are some changes we are making to civilian portions of the police department, for example, pulling uh, 911 and dispatch, which are is primarily civilian, and making that independent so that we aren't continuing to respond to everything as a police issue. Because the goal is to really be identifying, is this mental health? Is this EMS? Is this fire? You know, how do we better manage that? Right now, we actually recently found out that um, we analyzed data and found that we go to thousands of burglar alarms constantly and 95% of them are false alarms. So we are. So we have to change not just the police functions, but also the civilian parts. Um, oh, look at forensics, look at 911 dispatch, look at the civilian components as well, and we're looking at both parts. Thank you. And last question, and this is for both of you. Uh, information is power in, in today's society. What are some of the obstacles that Houston and Austin have towards publicizing uh, police transparency with information in times of misconduct releasing body cams and so on. And what ideas do you have to increase this information uh, in regards to transparency uh, and council member Plummer, if you could start us sure. off on that? No, yeah, that's that's a great question. So the, the first step for us is to have an, a truly independent oversight board to where we can look at those body cam footage. I, like for example, as a council member, I can make the request, but they won't, they will allow me to look at the body cam footage. You know, they probably would work it out, but in terms of actually being able to walk in there and ask to see it, I wouldn't be able to do that. And so really making it more public to where we can figure out a time limit to where they should be released, at least allowing council members and, and representatives to see it. Um, so we can make our own individual decisions is going to be is going to be crucial. These are those items that we're talking about right now are items that we're we're waiting to see what comes out of the task force uh, to see what type of permissions we're going to get and how that looks. And then we're going to have to look at this police contract and see what we can do uh, within the contract to to uh, to make it better for our citizens and not necessarily uh, for the police officers themselves. So uh, we're we're kind of a wait and see point right now, honestly. Uh, and so it's, we have about 45 more days um, until uh, our task force will put forth their um, their recommendations. And once that happens, then we can then take the next steps uh, moving forward um, to make the differences that we need to make. Cool. And for us, you know, our biggest leap forward in transparency was um, uh, that battle around the police association contract and not voting yes until we had increased transparency. Mm -hmm. And so we saw a lot of people injured simply for exercising their First Amendment rights um, at the protests 
um, over, uh, over police violence. And you can actually see the hundreds of complaints that came in. They're all publicly online on the Office of Police Oversight. So that stuff is all uh, transparent now. Before um, uh, the killing of Mike Ramos, there was never release, you know, automatic release of body camera footage. And now we've gotten to a place where within two months there will be um, a release of body camera footage in every single critical incident, um, as long as it wouldn't endanger a, like a criminal investigation. And so, um, so we're we're working towards that, and there's still so much more to do. But that um, I think the person asked the question put it exactly right. Right, the knowledge is power, and I think you know for so long uh, folks of color have said, hey, this did not go the way that uh, the judge said or the way that the police officer said, but it was so often. Um, community members were not believed, and now that it is on camera, um, mm -hmm. that on somebody's phone, or be that uh, on body cam or dash cam, uh, I think it, you know, we can really see what's happening in our society, but it only works when it's released to the public. Cool. Uh, well, I want to thank both of you for uh, hopping on uh, tonight, a uh, very meaningful discussion, and I appreciate the work that you both do in your, in your respective cities. Um, so, so yeah, much appreciated. And I, I hope you both, you know, I, I, I look forward to seeing you guys do great things and, uh, just, you know, take care, stay safe and, and, uh, talk to you guys later. All right. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah. Bye-bye. Appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks.